Thank you, Joe. Um, as uh, it's beautifully said, I'm Nicholas. I am the CTO of Gaslamp Games. Um, Casual Connect asked us to come and say a few words about Dungeons & Dreadmore, and we, we had a company meeting and had a conversation along the lines of, we should send some, you know, we can send one of our brilliant, dynamic, charismatic, witty, funny, handsome business individuals, or let's send the lead programmer. Ooh, that one, that one. So they sent the lead programmer. Um, thankfully, I did about a third of the writing with the other two founders of the company, uh, and we're just going to talk a little bit about humorous writing, how we did it, what worked, what didn't work, and I'm just going to ramble for 50 minutes. And, uh, Joe said if I, if I get somebody to choke on their food while I'm talking, I win the conference. I get some sort of prize bag. I don't know. So, um, today's agenda, what's Dungeons of Dreadmore? Why do you care about Dungeons of Dreadmore? Um, why is it humorous? Why did we make a funny game, which is sort of the, the curse of many games try to be funny and fail? What didn't we do? What did we do? Uh, what were the results? And maybe a little question and answer period, if time permits. Um, there we go. So this is Dungeons & Dreadmore. This is our first title. Um, we launched on Steam about this time last year. It's a comic fantasy roguelike dungeon crawler. We, so NetHack, Rogue, uh, Lindley's Dungeon Crawl, any of these things. We, we took those core gameplay mechanics, which has been around since the time when you know, dinosaurs walked the earth. Uh, we put a really nice skin on it, a really nice graphical user interface with a lot of character, and we put in a lot of writing throughout the course of the game when we designed it. Everything has text. The text is written in such a way that as you explore the game, you see these little funny messages come up in the tooltips. Um, all of our skills are sort of being imbued with this. We have uh, skills, we have, um, you know, skills like sagacity, nimbleness, caddishness, savvy. Um, you don't have particularly normal weapons. You have a crafting system. That's the My Little Anvil Junior Smithing Kit up there. Um, you fight fantasy monsters like this sad looking spark thing. Um, and so, gas lamp. Was sort of this was just something we were working on in our basements. Total cost of doing the game was somewhere between $2,000 and $4,000, but there's about five years of sweat equity in it. Um, and we thought, well, we'll make our $2,000 back, and maybe we'll have enough left over for, I don't know, a nice bottle of scotch or something. And we really came out of the, out of the gate and were totally surprised by the reaction. And one of the things that worked really well for us is the writing and the humor. Um, some reviews. Uh, Total Biscuit is a, a gentleman who runs a YouTube channel. Apparently, this is a thing the kids do nowadays. Um, he does a series where he previews new games. He did one for Dungeons of Dreadmore. Um, and as he, he sort of explains halfway through, it's like they made this game for me, for me. Um, I think we, we put some reference in that he appreciated. Uh, game Informer magazine. Uh, started their review saying, judging Dungeons of Dreadmore solely on its charm and wit would make it a Game of the Year contender. The next sentence was, unfortunately, we do not judge games solely on their charm and wit. Um, regardless, we got a, an immensely positive reaction. Uh, PC Gamer named us their 2011 Indie Game of the Year against some very stiff competition. Um, IGN nominated us for Best RPG of the Year. Uh, we lost to Skyrim. Anybody heard of those guys? And, and some, where is, where is Bethesda anyways? It's Maryland or something? Anyway, so one of the big things that we took away from this, we were trying to figure out, well, what, what went so right is that the writing worked for us very well. So why did we decide to make a humorous game? And I'm gonna say this again. Generally, if you try to make a humorous game, it's like the kiss of death. You end up with this thing, and people look at it, and they go, I, I don't understand this. Is this supposed to be funny? What's going on? So somehow we did it. Um, so why did we try to do it? We wanted to differentiate ourselves from everybody else out there. There's a lot of very serious games, a lot of very high fantasy games. Son, only you with, can fulfill the legacy of the epic prophecy and defeat the mystic rune kings by claiming these three magical amulets. No. Um, we want to do something light and funny. 
we wanted to do something that would inoculate, in a sense, the players of Dreadmoor so that when they had to deal with the roguelike mechanism of permadeath, where you die, you die, that's it, game over, you restart, no matter how far down you've gone, so long, nice to see that character start a new one. That's a fairly hardcore, hardcore gameplay mechanic. We wanted something to lighten the load a little bit to make it so that you're rewarded. So whenever you die in Dreadmore, you have a big piece of text on the screen that says, congratulations, you died. And people feel better about it because, hey, at least they, they got a, some sort of award or something. Um, so that was a big motivation. Um, we wanted something to introduce you to a new thing because a lot of the players that we wanted to attract had not necessarily played a roguelike game before. Um, and so we needed a little, a little frosting to sort of sugarcoat the experience. We'll talk more about this later. Um, so those are, the, those are the fake reasons. Those are the noble reasons we came up with for why we did it after we shipped the title. Here are the real reasons we did it. Um, we had a bunch of silly animations, and that set the tone for the rest of the game, um, because at some point, Dreadmore was actually an inherited project from another studio I was involved with that didn't do so well, and so we ended up with it, and our art director took one look at the art, which I had sort of art directed from contractors, and he was just like, no. So the only thing we really ended up with was a bunch of silly animations, and we sort of took those and ran with it. Um, we also ran out of money. $2,000 does not go a long way towards making a game. Writing is cheap. Writing is recyclable. You know, uh, it's something we could all do, and so we just ran with that. And also, at the end of the day, we didn't re really come to terms with the fact that we'd made a humorous game until we'd actually done it. And then we're like, oh, well, that happened. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about this, this concept of introducing the players to new things. Um, at 2008, uh, anybody here of Portal? Nobody's heard of Portal. This must be a casual conference. <laughs> OK. Um, 2008, Eric Woolpaw, who was the lead comedy genius behind The Way to Companion Cube, and Kim Swift, gave a talk at GDC um, about Valve's strategies for um, content creation. And one of the things that they were big on is we have this new mechanic, which is the portal gun. And this is something that's never been seen in a video game before. And we need to introduce it to the players in a way where they feel comfortable. And so they said, well, OK, how are we going to sugarcoat it? And we're going to, we have this humorous dialogue. We have this stream of mechanisms. And the whole time you go through, you have you know, the brilliantly funny GLaDOS writing just sort of carries you through the game. Um, the in-house term we use it for this at Gaslamp Games is mayonnaise, because everything is better if you smother it in mayonnaise. How are you enjoying your lunch? There you go, needs more mayonnaise. So it's, it's something you can use if you have something that you want people to be able to more easily digest. Humor is a good tool for this. Um, OK, so why should you make a humorous game? This is a talk on social, mobile, free to play, uh, and so forth. So we have an old-fashioned business model compared to a lot of you people out here. We make games. People actually pay us to buy the game, and then they pay us for the expansion pack. And I, I keep having to explain this to people at this conference because they keep going to me, so what's your angle? How are you monetizing it? We, they pay to buy the game, and then they pay to buy the expansion pack. But what about ad sharing? They pay to buy the, and you know. So, there are lessons here for those of you who are not doing this. Um, so these are dark secrets of monetization power that we reveal to you under duress today. Please use them for good, not evil. Um, Dreadmore's gameplay, where you have the, you go through, you find rooms, you find things in rooms, you get feedback, you get new humor, new items, new art, whatever, is ultimately it's a Skinner box. And the Skinner box was, um, well, it was named after a psychologist named Skinner. And it's the experiment where you basically, rats respond to stimuli. And you put a rat in a room and it has to do some sort of conditions and it gets a pellet. And the rat will just keep doing everything it can to get more and more and more pellets. Um, and what Skinner learned, which is really interesting, is that if you have an irregular stimulus where sometimes the, only sometimes the rat will get the pellet or the rat will only get the yummy pellet or whatever. Is, is, is there such a thing as a yummy pellet? I don't know. 
If you do that, then the rat is more enthusiastic consistently about trying to hit the lever or jump on the tiles, whatever it is that you want your particular Skinner box to do. So by having a game where you find these new humorous things, and maybe every so often you'll find something you haven't seen before, or you'll find a particularly clever joke, we keep throwing this at you, we keep encouraging you to play and play and play, and as we do this, we're building this repetitive stimulus sort of a behavior. Um, so in terms of a psychological model, that's a good takeaway, is if you, there's, there's a lot of talks at this conference which has sort of been, you know, uh, monetizing ad revenue, monetize your ad revenue, monetize your monetization, put ad revenue in your monetization. Um, the Soul Crusher 3000 will directly harvest human souls and put them directly into the app store for maximum profit. The Orbital Gaming Space Laser will shoot your users and inject their hideous screams directly into your revenue platform, which we then monetize. Uh, at some point, it becomes about content. And one way of generating compelling content is through laughter, because if you, you know, you laugh and it feels good, and you're happy, and you say, okay, I'm gonna go through that door, because there's gonna be some kind of a funny ax behind it or something. Or, I mean, even in Dreadmore, even the traps are humorous. Um, we, have, um, we have the dreaded bling mine, created by the dwarves as some sort of hideous weapon, and um, you basically, if you land on it, you pee gold. So even, even the negative stimuli are given a little positive sugar coating, and you keep playing because you keep wanting more and more stimuli. So there you go, take it back to your studios, create the next generation of obsessive, clicky things, and make zillions of dollars. But yeah, good but not evil. So, Having said that, how do you not write a humorous game? A lot of people have tried this. There's been a lot of people who have tried to go out and make funny video games, and they sit there and people just go, eh, really? Um, somehow we managed to dodge this bullet. So here's sort of the list of things that, after looking at video games that didn't work versus us, we think these are things to avoid. Um, jokes about poop very rarely work. Uh, unless you're Jonah Vasquez, and we'll explain this at the end of the, of the talk. Um, in general, I mean, if you, it's very hard to do scatological humor and make it actually funny. Um, jokes at the expense of somebody else, jokes that hurt, jokes that are demeaning or insulting. Uh, nobody comes away having a good time, especially if you're one of the people who just got hurt. Signposting. There's a tendency in funny games where it's, you know, look, 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 here's a joke coming up. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Here it comes. And then, you, you know, it wasn't actually funny, and then you have the build up to this point, and nothing happens. And then they do it again, and again, and again. There's a lot of, a lot of casual stuff that tries to be funny does this a lot. Uh, anything lame, basically, if you aren't laughing at it, you probably shouldn't expect your customers to laugh at it. Um, if you're not laughing at it after you've been developing the game for nine months, and you're sick and tired of everything and you just want to go home and you know, go into accounting like your mother said, then it, your customers still probably won't laugh at it. You need jokes that are that good that nine months later, you still think this is funny. Um, cynicism and sarcasm by themselves are not funny. Oscar Wilde, I think, said sarcasm was the lowest form of humor. Um, but that may be a misattribution on my part. Uh, and this last one, this is kind of a sensitive subject. Um, jokes about rape. This is something that the AAA industry in particular thinks is acceptable to put into a video game. It's not. Duke Nukem Forever was a recent example of this where they had, they were trying to be funny. They're a, a textbook example. At one point in the game, the wholesome twins, who are, I believe, named out, sort of inspired after Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, are forcibly raped and impregnated by alien monsters. They then apologize to you for being forcibly raped and impregnated, and then they explode in showers of alien babies. Um, who thought this was funny? I have, you know, somebody out there, may, I mean, maybe this is the product of some sort of joke writing committee of the damned or something, thought that this is something that will make our players laugh, and it doesn't work. Rape jokes are not a good idea. Rape jokes will get you in hot water with just about everybody, and they're not funny, and they're not a good idea, and just let's please stop doing it, okay? Um, Penny Arcade did this recently as well. They had a huge furor over um, one of their comics had a phrase, uh, rape to sleep by the dick wolves, and that's still ongoing a year later. You don't want this. 
So please, focus test, try your jokes, make sure they're funny, make sure they aren't offending people, make sure they aren't actively causing rage and ire, and we will all be better for a world without rape jokes in video games. So, what do we look for when we write? Um, basic competence, please, you know, grammar is good, spelling is good. If you're distracted by misplaced commas or dangling fragment participles, whatever they are, you're not gonna be having a good time laughing, especially if you're an editor, but editors have no sense of humor anyways. Dry wit. Um, Dreadmore, universally people think we're from England because we apparently have a British sense of humor. We're actually from Canada. Some parts of Canada are in fact more British than England, including where our studio is, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but having that sense of writing where no matter how ridiculous your internal mythos is, and Dreadmore's internal mythos is pretty damn ridiculous, if you take it very seriously and you go through it with this perfectly straight face and you present these, these you don't present these silly things as silly things, you present them as this is a perfectly serious concept that we're very, we're very serious about. We, you know, we really do expect you to attack your enemies with, um, what's a good example? Uh, you know, the dwarven Swiss army sword, or um, you know, some sort of triple-bladed axe or the third axe is for redundancy. And we take this very seriously. All of our horrible spells and ridiculous monsters are very serious. And if you can present things like that and you're not signposting, you tend to get good results. Does it make us laugh? Things in the game that make us laugh, again, this is, this is sort of the gold standard. If you are not laughing when you put something in the game that is meant to be funny, your customers sure as heck aren't, okay? You need to make sure that it's funny to you and you need to make sure it's funny to you six months later. Um, this good example is in Dreadmore. You can find um, bauxite uh, ore in the dungeon and the description simply reads, a begrudging source of aluminum. And there's something funny about a grumpy piece of ore lying around, fine, aluminum if you want it, sure, that I found six months after we put it in, I was like, yep, that's, that may be, that may be chuckle. Um, theft, we steal a lot. Good comic steal, uh, Robin Williams, I think, has said that, or maybe that's just his career, I don't know. Um, if there, there's only so many jokes, you can feel free to liberate a few of the good ones and remix them and so on and so forth and bend them to your own ends. Um, Internal authenticity. We look for internal authenticity and a way of sort of, again, making sure that when we present funny stuff, it's still part of the same co sort of coherent universe that everybody else who's talking about storytelling will be lecturing on. This is still important. Basic sort of rules of storytelling still apply. Dwarf Fortress is a, a good example of this. Anybody played Dwarf Fortress? I see a few hands going up. Anybody read about Boat Murdered? I see the same few hands going up and a few more who haven't played Dwarf Fortress. Okay. Boat Murdered was a let's play of Dwarf Fortress by the something awful goons. Um, and it received a certain amount of attention at the time because it's basically, it's 40 pages of dwarves dying at the hands of skeletal elephants and plague and lava and goblin raiding and more skeletal elephants. And Dwarf Fortress presents these, these very ridiculous events. Again, with perfect simplicity, perfect seriousness and in a way that is internally authentic to their background and how you, you believe that dwarves will behave. And it's, it's amazing. It's a game that tells a story and makes you laugh purely through generative mechanisms. It presents you with these things so absurd you just have to laugh, doing it seriously the entire time, and it's procedurally generated. Um, lampshade hanging. Um, if you have an absurd situation, do feel free to call attention to it and just sort of move on. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with the quote from The Big Lebowski, but it's true. This is bowling, there are rules. I haven't looked at these slides in a bit. Okay, writing influences. Um, allegedly, we are influenced by Terry Pratchett. Everybody says we are influenced by Terry Pratchett. I don't know if we are influenced by Terry Pratchett. Um, I mean, we've read Terry Pratchett, but is he an influence? In only so much as I suppose you can't avoid being compared to him if you're writing comic fantasy. Um, Spike Milligan, British humorist, is the main person responsible for the radio program, the, the Goon Show, which was the big inspiration for Monty Python, which again inspired everybody else. Um, we were very heavily inspired by comic fantasy of the 80s, 
we were very heavily inspired by serious fantasy of the 80s, which is sometimes indistinguishable from the comic fantasy of the 80s. It's hard to tell. Um, again, Portal. Um, but as, sort of as a higher point, if you are going to be writing games, and you're going to be writing four games, first you have to read. Uh, writing does not happen in a vacuum. Writing is something where you need a sense, you need literacy. You need to have all these creative influences coming to you from the news, from stories, books, magazines, music. And then they sit, and you, you mix them, and you, you churn them up, and then out comes magic. But in order to do that, you need to have the influences in the first place and to be open to them in the first place. Uh, OK. So how do you write for a game? How did we write for a game? Um, the Gaslamp game's writing process primarily involves caffeine abuse. At this point, it's now become a ritual um, of epic and terrifying proportions. Basically, we had a small team. We drank way too much coffee to the point where we are giggling at trees. And then we started to write. And this is basically how all television comedy is written, is you get a bunch of people in a small room with far too much coffee. I think maybe Hollywood has slightly better stimulants, but they're not legal yet, so we can't have them. Um, and off you go. Comedy writing is usually best done with multiple writers. And the reason for this, and the reason why your favorite television shows, I mean, they have teams of 30, 40 comic writers sitting in a room churning off comedy, is because comedy works best when you can bounce off of something, right? You need to bounce off of your other writer. You make a silly idea to say, you know, your art director and your art director comes back, it's like, well, you know, you could do this, and then he runs with it, and then so on and so forth. And there's a back and forth. And as you have this back and forth, A, all the jokes that aren't really all that funny, they get filtered out because you can see that the rest of your, your writing team isn't laughing and isn't having a good time. Um, at the same time, because you have this back and forth, you have this feedback system where the, the writing feeds back into itself and folds back into itself. And as it does this, it slowly becomes out of control. And it's when it's sort of at that, that right moment when it explodes, that's when you tend to get all of your best and funniest material. And then you sort of take that and you save the, that 1%, that you skim the cream off, and then you put it in the game, and then you go on to the next thing. Um, and as, of course, as you iterate through the game, I'm, I'm a big believer in iterative game design. Um, I don't think you ever write a design document and it's the holy gospel. Um, it, it doesn't happen. You never get it right the first time. And as you iterate through games, you, you iterate through writing as well. Stuff gets left in the ground, and you can, you know, you kill your babies, and more lame jokes get thrown out, more good ones get thrown in. And at the end of the day, if all goes well, and your writers actually are funny enough and have senses of humor, it probably helps that um, everybody at Gaslamp is basically stark raving bonkers. Then at that point, you have something which is actually funny and is actually a product. But that's, you know, the teamwork, feedback, iteration, drink way too much coffee. Um, a few specific writing techniques which we use for Dreadmore. Uh, Dreadmore is very big on referential humor. Uh, anybody here heard of TV tropes? I can't actually see who's holding hands up anymore. This projector light's too bright. So I'm going to pretend people held their hands up. Um, Dreadmore has two pages on TV tropes. And TV tropes, it's a, it's a web page that is designed to catalog writing gimmicks uh, and to sort of analyze why does writing work and what are the tools of the trade that writers use. It's also something where you can, you can get lost in it for hours and hours and hours looking at the patterns of your, your favorite television show and looking, ah, so really Buffy the Vampire Slayer used these 75 same patterns that are repeatedly known writing devices and employed in these ways or, or bent in these ways or something. Dreadmore on TV Tropes has its own page for referential humor and things that we gave a shout out to, which apparently is some sort of mark of dubious pride. The nice thing about having references to other mediums or tropes or video games or whatever in the game, um, when you get it, you're like, ah, I know what he's talking about. I feel clever. And if you don't get it, you just sort of ignore it. It doesn't come up in your, on your filter, and you think, oh, this is a perfectly normal um, battery-operated sword. Move right along. Um, 
And so there's a difference, again, this ties into this concept of, of signposting jokes. You don't want to actually tell people it's a reference. You want to put the reference there and sort of let them pick it up or not pick it up as they will or as they won't. And if they do, they laugh, and if not, they ignore it. And either way, everybody wins. Um, and in addition to making you laugh when you have a reference joke, it's a reward for being so clever and literate. You think, ah, I am a man who has watched television. Today, that has paid off. I understood something in a video game. <laughs> and that's a rewarding experience. Um, feel free to self-reference as well. I mean, dig into your back IP catalog, reference other things in the game that you may already have seen. It's a good tool. Um, subverting tropes, we do this a lot as well. There are certain common fantasy elements that basically have been around, they were old when Tolkien was writing, it should probably be taken out back and shot. Um, so um, you subvert them and you, you use them as a starting point and you bend them and you send them off again and then you'll have a joke. Um, some vague examples from Dreadmoor. We have a spell which summons walls of fire from the elemental plane of walls of fire. Anybody who has played Dungeons and Dragons knows that they have elemental planes for everything up to and including pastrami. We just ran with it. Um, Dreadmoor has dwarves and elves. I'm not a big fan of having Tolkien-esque references in your game. If the best you can do is a game about dwarves and elves, um, it's everybody has a game about dwarves and elves. So they stuck into Dreadmoor, they're subverted. There is, as you play through the game, we hint at a backstory. I mean, it's what the, our previous speaker was talking about. You don't actually tell people the backstory, you just sort of allude to it. It becomes clear that there was a war between the dwarves and the elves. The elves lost and are now extinct. In the process, they invented terrible weapons like the elven ingot grinder. Um, the dwarves won, but it came at a terrible cost, and their society, you now have the dwarven plastic smiths who sit upon their thrones of plastics wearing the plastic crown and cursing the age of man. And dwarven society has basically evolved into the home shopping channel. Uh, we have golems made of cutlery. We have a spoon golem. It's a pile of spoons that attacks. Um, other games have werewolves. We have were-diggles. And there's were-diggle-in. Um, and that's, a lot of that plays off of sort of the traditional were werewolf stuff. A lot of it plays off of Twilight. Uh, Dreadmoor has vampirism. Um, because, again, we've read Twilight, our vampires attack with sparkles. We have wizards in Dreadmoor. Um, the big game mechanic in Dreadmoor is a good example of a game mechanic feeding into the writing, feeding into the game mechanic. Um, when you're in the dungeon and you need more mana, you have to drink alcohol. Alcohol replenishes your mana. It is alluded to in the game that basically most wizards and the great wizard kings are all alcoholics. And if you see one in the street, you should probably just give them a couple of bucks and shuffle away. Necronomiconomics. Um, necro necromancy, economics, the necronomicon, and you sort of glue it together, you get necronomiconomics, which is sort of the economy of the undead. Um, so again, take familiar things and then bend them to your own ends. Hanging a lampshade. Um, this, is, this is a writing technique where you take something that is absurd, you point out how absurd it is, and you move on, and you're done. Um, there is an axe, there's a golden axe in Dreadmore, which is, of course, a reference to golden axe, and the, the, the reference basically says, you know, this axe made of solid gold is very impractical. And there you go, done. Um, things that are just plain funny. There's a film, um, it's got George Burns and Walter Matthau in it, The Sunshine Boys. And at one point, Walter Matthau goes on this big spiel, because he's an out-of-work Broadway comedian or something, and he goes on this big spiel, he's like trying to explain to his son, who's heard this, you know, 30,000 times, words of a K in them are funny. Pickle has a K. Pickle is funny. And he goes on to explain that the potato chips he's trying to sell, you know, they don't have a K in them. They're not funny. Frumpies is a terrible name for a brand of potato chips, because it's not a funny word. Um, there are genuinely funny words. If you find one of them, hold on to it for dear life. Um, at some point, somebody at Gaslamp, I believe our CEO, uh, Daniel Jacobson, had the idea that we should have loot fisk in the game. And how many people have ever eaten loot fisk? OK, there's a couple survivors. Loot fisk is a Norwegian delicacy, uh, Scandinavian delicacy. You take white fish and you put it in lye and you cure it in lye for months, 
then you rehydrate it and eat it at family dinners while your mother tells you about life in the old country. It is possibly the worst food known to man. It's basically, it's been described as kind of like whale vomit. Um, at some point, we decided we needed to have loot fisk in the game as a food item, and we put it in. And then at some point, somebody said, we should have a loot fisk god. So there's a loot fisk god in, in, in Dreadmore. And again, loot fisk has a K in it, and words with a K in it are funny. So we have a loot fisk god, and we have a, a heraldic loot fisk cube. You put anything into it, it turns into loot fisk, which you sacrifice to the loot fisk god, who gives you weapons that smell like fish. And if you put the loot fist cube into the loot fist cube, because everybody thinks they're clever, and they're like, oh, what happens if I put the loot fist cube in the loot fist cube? Oh, it explodes, and it takes out the entire dungeon, because we thought of that before you did. Um, Necronomicanomics is another good example of a, a funny word. Um, you, you, you stumble on these things by accident, but you need to recognize what they are, and then you, you grab them, and you collect them, and off you go. Uh, layers of humor. People like different things. People, some people like incredibly sophisticated wit. Um, there's a good line in Blackadder where they're talking about, you know, somebody is so desperate he'd laugh at a Shakespearean comedy. So we have all sorts of layers of humor. We have, we have a, you know, say, a reference to um, Machiavelli's The Prince. We have a prince mushroom that is better loved than feared. Uh, at the same time, we also have a monster that's described as having well-rendered buttocks. So you find something for everybody. You want to have something that's for the low denominator, something that's for the high denominator, something that everybody can grab onto, and there's something, there's a joke in there for you. Um, DreamWorks Animation, the guys who made Shrek and Madagascar, uh, they do this extremely well. Any of the people who do films that appeal to both kids and parents, they do this very well. If you've seen, um, you know, parents, if you, you go to something like Cars 19, and they haven't made the effort to put things in there that your kids don't notice, but you will, you will spend the entire movie trying to kill yourself with popcorn. It can be done, but not if you throw it at your head, but you're going to try anyways. Um, put something in at all levels. Uh, okay, again, not alienating people. Do not alienate people when you're writing jokes. Um, you, can, you can make regional jokes in a way that actually makes people think good, think, you know, wow, I, I'm proud to be a Viking ancestry. We do this. Swedish people love Dreadmore. For, we get fan mail praising the fact that we have Swedish alcohol in it, which they're surprised that nobody, you know, who outside of Sweden has heard of this stuff. Um, we get emails saying, I'm so proud that, you know, my culture is, is respected and represented by your Viking wizardry skill tree. Hail Odin. Um, we get people telling us their Lutefisk horror stories. It's great. So if you're going to do this, do it in a way that props people up. Don't do it in a way that makes people feel bad about themselves. Um, and again, sort of another important thing is having an internally consistent background. You want to have the illusion of depth here. And you know, I, I was going to go talk about this. Somebody else already did it, so it's obviously a good idea. Um, there is a lot of backstory in Dreadmore that we don't show you and we only allude to. And frankly, you know what? It's probably funnier if you come up with it yourself. If you come up with something that you think is funny, at least one person's going to guarantee to be laughing at it, which is you. So we let the players consciously fill in the blanks. And when they fill in the blanks, um, that's the point where what they come up with is going to be something they sort of filled in the blank with the funniest thing they could think of. It's like Mad Libs. So you know, we have some internally corroborative detail. Uh, we, Dreadmore has the Bolt Council and the job of the Bolt Council is to promote the use of crossbows throughout the dungeons, and they have training seminars, and the shadowy assassination program that kills kings off who would dare to equip the military with the longbow. Um, and actually, again, a good example of game mechanics feeding writing. Dreadmore has crossbows in it. It doesn't have traditional longbows. And the reason for that is that our animator didn't want to animate a longbow, so we animated a crossbow instead, because he could do it in two frames instead of 20. We're cheap, and so we put some humor on it, and now we have a game with crossbow bolts. Um, the consistent use of plastic as a mining substitute for real dwarven industry. Um, you're, you're not told what happened in the war, but you can make some pretty good guesses. And again, what the player can think of is probably funnier than what we can think of, because you know they're guaranteed to have something that they think is funny because they came up with it. Um, okay. 
another opportunity from funny making a humorous game is that when it works, it works well, and you can build IP. We love building IP here. Everybody here has been about building IP. Um, so this fabulous guy is sort of our mascot monster. This is a Diggle. Um, we didn't want to have Tolkien monsters, so we started looking at um, the monster design that Akira Toriyama did for the Dragon Quest games. We started looking at a webcomic called Creatures in My Head. We didn't want to have um, John Romero in the book Masters of Doom. Um, there's a meeting, and, and, and Romero says something along the lines of, blah, 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 yet another hackneyed lab of mutated alien bullshit. So you want to avoid a hackneyed lab of mutated alien bullshit. You want to have something original. So we came up with original monsters. And this one, we didn't know it when we shipped. It's the one that took on a life of its own. And now you can buy Diggles on t-shirts. And people buy them and wear them. Um, you can buy them stuffed. Uh, buy a t-shirt today. Come visit our website. Um, so again, good writing generates additional revenue opportunities. You can build IP. You know, if maybe you can take it to television. I don't know. Um, we do some procedural stuff. Um, we have a random database of funny words, funny, carefully screened gas lamp words that have a gas lamp tone. Artifacts, monsters, um, rooms, player titles when they die. All of these are dragged out of the funny word database and mangled. And sometimes it's a miss, and sometimes it's a hit. But when the random name generator actually gives you something funny, you're like, ah, the shockingly small house of cake. Oh, good. Um, so again, you can, you can get really far with procedural generation. And this is what? This is, I don't know, 10 minutes worth of code and a couple hours shoving things into an XML database. And it's one of those things that makes people laugh, and it adds character. So look at ways where you aren't just writing you're writing in a manner that's sort of suitable for games. Because this is not television, this is not film, this is not books. These are games, this is an interactive thing. So when you're writing, even if it's serious writing, try to write in a way that is interactive, where you, you are using the medium to its full advantage, even if we don't know how to do that yet. Somebody has to figure it out, maybe it's you. Um, yeah, we basically stole it from Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress does this very well with their decor system, where you will find carvings, you know, um, this, this pillar is engraved with an image of a demon striking down a dwarf. The dwarf is in the, a crouched position and the demon is laughing. And you find these as you go along with terrible titles and it turns out that they're actually pretty amusing. Um, random word joining is cheap, easy, and fun. Okay, last but not least, here's the other big secret. How do you actually tell a poop joke? How do you put a poop joke in a game and make it funny? Um, poop by itself is not funny. And the master of this is Jonan Vasquez, the guy who did Invader Zim. Anybody seen Invader Zim? Oh, lots of hands. Oh, there we go. Uh, so at one point in the show, I mean, Vasquez is clearly obsessed with poop, but he never actually goes right out and says that. There's one scene in particular that illustrates the right way to do it if you must do it, um, and it's got Zim in a field over a flying saucer, and he's, he's got a suit on and a needle and the goggles, and the cow is in the alien tractor beam, and he's preparing to inject the cow full of doogie. And poop in context is funny. Um, poop by itself is not, but if you're doing something funny with poop in a larger context or, or, or whatever, then you might have something you can hook on to. So if you're going to have that kind of a joke, try to, try to hang it on something. Um, Dreadmore has in it the wand lore skill tree, which is the one that has all the wand polishing jokes. Um, and wand polishing is a euphemism for wand polishing. And at the end of the skill tree, it turns out the final skill, if you use it too much, you will go blind. <laughs> so again, context is, is key if you're going to do this sort of a thing. Um, all right, let's, let's wrap this up, and then we'll maybe answer some questions. Some takeaways for people. Here's your five bullet points. Humor is a great and effective tool for differentiating your product from every other game out there if you can do it. Um, we lucked out. We were able to do it. And if we had made a serious game, people would be much less likely to forgive Dreadmore for its many sins of being an indie project in a shoestring budget. 
we have an achievement on Steam for when you crash the game. Uh, it's called Suddenly the Dungeon Collapses, and it thanks you for participating in our involuntary beta testing program. An embarrassing number of people have that achievement, but because you get something for when the game crashes, you feel you, you have a laugh, and it's, it's just something else which adds character. Uh, of course, now that we've done it, nobody else can do it because they'll be imitating us. So you've got to find your own thing. Um, writing is cheap. Writing is really cheap. Unemployed English majors are available at universities near you, standing by. <laughs> Internships are available. They will work for the bad ramen. You don't even have to pay them the good ramen you pay the programmers in. You can pay them the bad stuff. Um, writing is hard. It's not that hard. It's not something you should be afraid of. There are problems, but there are mechanisms and tools and processes that you can use so that if you want to write a funny game or you want to write a game that's just good, full of good, solid writing, there are tools that exist and you can use them and they've been around since man first made a poop joke on the walls of a cave. Um, good writing builds your IP. I can't emphasize this enough. If you want to monetize your free-to-play ad revenue net split sharing death laser, you need something to hang it on. Good writing is a great tool for doing this. Impress people with your, your wit and your style, and then you sell them the plush toys, and you sell them the DiggleCon 2013 tickets, and then you start building something. Okay. These are personal opinions. I think the world has enough games that try really hard to be serious works of high fantasy and serious works of science fiction, and it, let's have some fun. Games are about fun. You're supposed to be enjoying yourselves. Let's have a few laughs. Let's realize, as Valve realized, they did user testing and they found out that 95% of the population thinks that smooth jazz music is funny. You can see it in the Portal 2 director's commentary. Let's, you know, test things, make games that amuse people. Let's be amusing. And while we're at it, let's really try not to be stupid, lame, or tasteless so we stop having funny games that have a bad reputation because the creators didn't laugh at them or maybe the creators have one of those senses of humor that involves torturing small animals. I don't know. But Let's just steer away from that and let's actually try to make games that have writing that sparkle. This isn't just about writing. All of the, the arts that we apply as game developers, writing, visual arts, music, sound, we've got music and sound guys here, loads of you guys, I'm really impressed. Programming, all of these things work in tandem and if you aren't thinking about writing and you aren't thinking about humor and you aren't thinking about style, then you're missing one of those elements. Writing is an important part of this toolbox. You have to figure out how to use it. Even if what they do in film or, or, or literature or whatever doesn't work, there are things there. Go, go forth, mine them. Come back to your company, put them in the game, charge diggle bucks for it, and then off you go to the races. That's it. I got no more slides. Um, happy to answer Wait, questions about writing Dread for Dreadmore or Dreadmore in general or whatever we've got. How much time do we have, Joe? Minutes. Oh, good. Oh, we, have, we have like 15 minutes, really, before the next one, but... All right, well, you know, at some point I'd like to not die. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> please, please give it up for, for Nicholas on the grounds that you have been eating and he has not been eating all this time, so... <laughs> all right. Okay. Now, now swallow and then ask a question. Who, who's the first? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, on, the, on the, I think one of the first expansions for Dreadmore that you made, uh, you added the uh, female character as an option. Yes. Was, uh, what was the reasoning for that? Was that fan pressure? Was that just personal decision? It was something that I'd always wanted from day one personally. We just never, we, well, we ran out of money. We couldn't afford the female hero until we actually had enough cash to hire another animator. Uh, the first one went off to work for Blizzard, where he's now churning out endless quantities of elves in tiny bikinis. Um, so actually, I'm going to talk about this very briefly. I'm going to back up 18 million slides. Um, this is the female hero. One of the things that worked out really well for us is that the female hero looks exactly like the male hero. She has the same giant eyebrows. She's not wearing 
three in stiletto heels and, you know, the elven mithril codpiece or whatever it is that people like to dress fantasy heroines in. You can't fight crime in these outfits. Uh, and it's a good way to take the 50% of the world's population that maybe you're trying to sell a game to and alienate the hell out of them. So if you're going to have a female character, make it something relatable, make it something that is sort of as equivalent to your male character as possible and don't feel obliged to dress them up in a tiny bikini and stilettos. Uh, we got a lot of really good feedback for doing exactly this. We got a lot of writing actually on feminist media analysis weblogs. Uh, the Border House, which is something you should read if you're interested in feminist critiques of games and film, gave us a very nice letter thanking us for, you know, having a, a female hero who is actually dressed to go fight monsters instead of I'm not sure what. So it was just it was just something we always wanted to do, and we fixed it, and we fixed it the way we were happiest with, and it was a total win. Anybody else? Next question. Oh, I see in the in the in the back corner. In the back corner. Make our runner run for it. Back corner? You yeah. probably just shout it out from here. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, you're not allowed to. I, I take it back. I lied. This is bowling, there are rules. <laughs> yeah. um, my question was, at what point did, uh, did you actually introduce writing into the game development process? And how did that, how did that change as the game was being developed? Was it you, you started with an idea and the game followed? And also, how did comedic writing affect that approach versus maybe writing a game that was like a little more traditional or serious? Um, oh, that's tough. There, it, it, it really it just sort of happened. And as, as it happened, we, came, we became more aware of it and we started to work with it. There were always item descriptions and monster descriptions in Dreadmore, but it used to be back when it was before Gaslamp got it, I had this interface where you had to go to a Sierra menu, which was clearly left over from about 1989 and hadn't been put out of its misery yet, click the icon to look at the thing, then click the icon to actually click on the thing that you're actually looking at, and then you'd get the description. And the importance of what we're doing really became clear once my business partners came up to me and said, we need tool tips. Mouse over it, and a tool tip will appear. And then people will actually read it instead of not reading it. And I resisted for the longest time, and then they persuaded me, and they were right. And as soon as you did that and the writing was out in the open, then it really became clear that this was sort of something that we needed to keep working on and polishing and more direction emerged. Um, it's always been, I mean, we are just writing kind of people. Everybody, everybody who works for Gas Lamp are fairly literate. We, we read a lot and we write a lot and text is just a thing that happens. Um, so there was really no specific point. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Back here. Oh, well, well, we'll get to you next. Um, I'm curious uh, how early you guys established a Bible or a world or the depth of the history, or did that evolve as you started and it started off quite light? We don't have a Bible. Um, for our next title, which is still secret and I can't talk about it too much, we have a little more of a Bible because the scope of the game is larger and because we want the writing for the next one to be a little, a little less referential and a little tighter in some ways, we think a Bible will help that process. Dreadmore never had one. It was basically, it was all in our heads. And for a lot of this stuff, we only really sort of started building on it once we put a little bit of it in. And then we started seeing rooms, room for growth and opportunity and so forth. And it just spirals out of control. Um, we should be thankful that it is as internally consistent as it is. Um, my personal theory is that most of the writing for Dreadmore actually came from dark gods who communicate to us through alien crystals that we place in our desks. But maybe that doesn't work for everybody. Next question. I just wanted to thank you for taking a stand on what's tasteless in games. It's really admirable of you to do it in front of everybody, and I'm hoping that more men in this room will take the same stand to help women in the industry. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Nicholas Vinny, the man who loves eyebrows more than anyone. <laughs>